say that. He was just like, you know, I'm just saying. Was supposed to get the DNA so I didn't make a shame uh, uh, this week. <laughs> um, but we are grateful. Thank you. We are grateful and thankful for this and the opportunity the Lord has given us to delight ourselves in the study of His holy and His righteous word. I'm grateful for those of you who are in the building for tonight and equally grateful <clears throat> for those of you who joined us virtually. We're thankful for your presence as well. Whatever you're doing to my Mac, leave us know. I don't know if they, they can they not hear me. Nope. They can't. No. All right, well, do what you need to do that they might hear me. Um, <clears throat> but tonight, um, again, I'm grateful that we're going to continue on our series on faith. I mean, you have been blessed so far by what we have. And in your to your walk with God, praise God. Um, tonight, <clears throat> are we ready? Tonight, um, I want to begin. I want you to go to your Bibles, uh, the Gospel of St. Mark. Gospel of St. Mark, chapter number 11. <clears throat> the layoff I'm uh, teaching on tonight, um, thankful and grateful for uh, Lisa has put out. PowerPoint is all on the screen in the building, so we're grateful and thankful for that as well. Um, but I want you to go on your Bibles first to Mark chapter 11. There is a um, passage of scripture that I did not add to our, <clears throat> our handout, and that's because I was meditating on this passage earlier today and discovered how awesome God is um, as He has laid out some things in this that will help make our lesson even the more um, palatable digestible, if you will, and so I want to kind of talk about Mark 11 before I get to the handout. Go with me. So turn in the Bibles to Mark 11. <clears throat> you know the story. It is the story where Jesus goes near to Jerusalem and is at the Mount of Olives and he sends over into the village opposite him um, for, the, for the disciples to go over and get a colt that is tied up. And as Jesus <clears throat> sends them to get this cult, we know based off of our understanding on the time engraved with faith in God that he's getting it. And this is where it's that uh, ascension into Jerusalem. Um, but later in the same passage, same Mark, Mark chapter 11, <clears throat> you'll find that after that happens, the Bible says that, that in verse 11, that Jesus went into Jerusalem. I want to take note of the fact that he went into Jerusalem and he went into the temple. The text says that when he looked around at all the things that was in the temple, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. I want you to take note that he looked at everything in the temple, then he left the temple. Verse 12 says that he went to Bethany. Verse 12 says he, he went the next day. They had come out of Bethany. Now notice he's gone to Bethany and now he's on his way out of Bethany. Uh, before heading to Bethany, he looked into the temple. Are you with me? And when he looked into the temple, he left and he went to Bethany. Then he came out of Bethany and he was hungry, right? And the text says he saw, I said, I want you to take note of, he saw a fig tree, a form. He saw a fig tree far off. He recognized it. And he, 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 the Bible says he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. So it stands the reason that when he saw the fig tree afar off, he did not see whether or not there were figs on the tree. He just saw the fig tree far off. He was looking for figs, though, because he didn't, you don't eat leaves. The text says um, he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. <clears throat> he 
He looked for figs in a season where the, the, the figs were not supposed to be there. What he sees up at a distance are looks like leaves, but he confirms that they're leaves when he gets up close. When he gets up close, he sees for certain that there are no figs. And the Bible says that when he sees that there are no figs, I'm in verse 14 of the text, it says, Jesus said to it, <clears throat> to what? The tree. The tree that could not, did not fulfill the hunger he had. He spoke to it. And he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. He sounds, y'all, forgive me for saying this, Jesus sounds a little crazy. He's talking to a tree. And he says to the tree, you're never going to bear fruit again. Are you with me? So verse 15 of the text says, um, they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now remember, he, he's coming back. He gets back to Jerusalem. This is the same temple that he looked in and he left. But on his return trip, he goes in and turns over everything in the temple. Y'all reading your, your Bible? Right? And then in verse 16 says that he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. So there were some things he just wasn't permitting to happen in the temple. Verse 17 says that he taught, saying to them, this, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him. Be careful when you start trying to clean the church. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Verse 20, say verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, and, and Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, it seems strange to me that they're telling Jesus what happened to the fig tree. Because after all, Jesus spoke to the fig tree, and when he spoke to the fig tree, Jesus was crystal clear about what he expected to happen with the fig tree. That way, on the return journey, when he sees the tree wither, Jesus is not alarmed at all by its withering because it is, what has happened to it is exactly what he spoke to it. The people who have the challenge with what Jesus is doing are those who are with him, who heard him, are you with me? Follow him, get to the tree, and they're surprised because the tree is withered. And Jesus says to them about their disposition. That is, surprised by, are you with me? The tree being withered. He says to them these words. I find it interesting. He says, um, have faith in God. You're hearing me curse the tree and coming by it and you being surprised that it is, as I said, in the mind of Jesus constitutes having a lack of faith in God. How many of you are with me? <laughs> and so now, now um, faith in God rests in the outcome of what God says or the ability to see it. Are you with me? Right? Because if you can't see what God says, then perhaps you may be one who, who is familiar with faith but really don't have faith in God. 
Are y'all with me? So, so I thought that was interesting because, because then he goes on to say, we looked at this verse last week. He says, for assuredly I say to you, whosoever says to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Those words by Jesus describe his actions in speaking to the fig tree, right, and it being withered. So he reflects what faith in God looks like. He reflects the power of faith in God because it stands sure in what is spoken and what is spoken is so and he accepted it. Jesus had no problem believing that the tree would be withered when he came by. It was the disciples and Peter who struggled with that. Are y'all with me? All right, that being said, I just want you to hold that. We'll, we'll come back to that. You'll, you'll see that come to play in some other things I'm going to share tonight. Um, Tonight, I'm giving you what will be and what is the foundational scripture for this entire teaching on faith. This entire teaching on faith will, will put our feet on the cement of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. This is what it says, you know it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him who's the him. Well, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's our foundational scripture. Our, our confession statement, say confession statement. The reason I'm giving you a confession statement is we learned last week and to, even today as Jesus displays that we ought to exercise our faith with our tongue. We have to speak things by faith. And so I'm helping us develop this practice by giving us a faith confession, if you will. And so I want you, I want you to read, if you haven't read it, for those of you who, who have joined us virtually, look on the handout that you have available to you or look on the screen behind me. Those of you who are in the building, just read that confession to yourself. Just read it quickly. Let me know when you're done. You done? All right, all right, all right. Now, I want you to just repeat after me the confession. I want you to read it first before I lead you in the confession because I want it to be your confession. And you couldn't have made the confession without reading it first because you may not want to about it as you just repeat after me. So, so just repeat after me and say, we confess that it is our desire to gain a greater understanding of the subject matter of faith that we may become more adept at living by faith so that we might be more pleasing to God in every endeavor. Now that surmises what our objective is with our entire faith series, right? So I'm going, we're going to be repeating that as time passes. So let's work. You ready to work? Let's work. Last week, we established the fact in connection with Matthew 11 and 22, have faith in God, that we are not simply to have faith, but we are to have faith in God, right? It's not enough for you to say, I have faith. Right, because faith alone is dead. And faith in anything other than God is unnecessary. Faith has been given to the believer as a tool in order to assure for the, the believer their relationship with God and to equip the believer to be able to have the appropriate type of relationship that God expects of the believer. Am I making sense? That's why the Bible says that he has given, God has given to every man a measure of faith. That's to secure that you're able to be in right relationship with God. And the way that you're in right relationship with God does not determine how you determine it, but God has already determined that if it's going to be the kind of relationship that pleases God, it requires faith. 
Does that make sense? It's, it, it, let, me, let me do it this way. It's kind of like this. You may be on the cell phone care, uh, company of, say, T-Mobile. Built into the phone is a way for you to communicate with T-Mobile. Before you bought the phone, T-Mobile put the device inside of it. You picked it up. You selected your phone. You go all over the country with your phone, but you are able to connect with the T-Mobile system because of what they put in it. I'm trying to tell you that God put faith in you for a reason. Him putting faith in you removes, watch this, removes from you the ability to have the excuse, I can't please God. He ensured that you would be able to please him because he gave you a measure of faith. In fact, built into the system of faith, God equips you, watch this, to grow your faith. That's why the Bible says we go from faith to faith. So you can get better at pleasing God the more you develop your faith. Are y'all with me? So that, that's why we're dealing with this. So last week, last week, I, I gave you on the A, what I call the A's of faith. And the first thing we looked at, and I'm truck with me in, with your hand out, is the academics of faith. I won't go back and repeat this, but I just want you to take note of the fact that the academics of faith taught us that we ought to speak to. Remember, Jesus spoke to the fig tree. Right? We got to speak to, or we have to give verbal directives to the things that oppose our relationship with God. We have to, we have to speak to, and we got to speak to it out of a confident heart. Let me go back to my example of Jesus. Remember, Jesus, are you with me? Jesus spoke to the fig tree, told the fig tree that it wasn't going to give no more fruit to nobody ever, and he walked on. On the way back, we're not told where Jesus addressed that tree at all. He wasn't curious about whether or not it was so. Y'all got to say with me. He was not curious about it. Peter was. The disciples was. But Jesus walked by because he spoke to it in confidence, right? And he, he, he felt like the outcome was going to be what he said. Are you with me? That's the academics of faith on display. We also talked about the activation of faith. Right? That is, you know that there's going to be some opposing circumstances to your speaking to the to the mountain, to speaking to the issue, but you can't let the opposing circumstances alter your what you've spoken. Am I making sense? Just because Peter questioned Jesus about what he did, Jesus didn't even bother to render any response to Peter's question. He just said, you got faith in God. I love you. He said, look, your problem is you ain't got no faith in God, and you are not my problem. Your lack of faith is not my problem. Are you with me? So you, you cannot alter the verbalization of what you spoke, right? Especially when it is challenged. You got you to hold fast to it. That's the activation of faith. And then we looked at the authority of faith. Are y'all with me? I'm just reviewing. The authority of faith. That means that because you've been given faith, you have the right to exercise faith, then exercise it. Don't let things challenge your faith and you not oppose them. Don't let things challenge your faith. Watch this. Your God stands in what you've spoken and, what, and, and your belief in God and you let something move you off of that without a fight. Remember we fight the good fight of faith. Are you with me? So you got to contend. You got to wage war. You got to fight for it. These are all the things that we looked at. We looked at these three things. But today and we looked at them under, under the banner of uh, it was developing deliberate faith. This is, this is how you develop it. Well, today, I want to talk about practicing it. You got to practice it. It's one thing to develop it. It's another thing to practice it. Are y'all with me? All right? Y'all ready to work? I keep asking y'all that question, but y'all ain't responding like it. Yes, sir. All right. 2 right. Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7. It reads, For we walk by Faith, not by sight. The word walk in its original language in this passage is the word peripateo, and it means live. So when we read this passage, it actually says we live by faith, not by sight. Are you with me? Living by faith simply means you act. You speak, you think, based on, watch this, what you believe to be 
true. Not on what you feel to be true. Most of our faith gets overridden by our feelings. Am I making sense? But faith is not based in a feeling. Faith is based in the fact of God. That's why it's not just faith. It's faith in God. Are you with me? Now, listen to this passage again. It says, for we walk by faith. That's the A clause. The B clause says, not by sight. So what is, what is, what is, it, what is it, this, this passage saying? It is saying to us that those who live or walk by faith do so, watch this, with some degree of blindness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you with me? My question to you tonight is what type of blind are you? Are you the right type of blind? Am I making sense? Are y'all with me? Are you the right type of blind? Because if we're going to please God, it requires that we live by faith and not by sight. So we are going to have to have some degree of blindness in order to please God. Are you with me? So let's talk about types of blindness. Um, are you the both eyes open type of blind? You know what I mean by that? Really not blind at all. You're a sightseer. You got to see it to believe it. Are you, are you with me? <laughs> that, 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 that if you don't, if you don't have view of it, then it's not so. Are, are you with me? But well, sightseeing living is no faith living at all. Because the text suggests. That we live by faith and what? Not by sight. Let me, let me put this in another way. You know, you ever met those people who they just got to know everything? <laughs> you said they won't do nothing unless they know everything. Right? It ain't. It, 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 that's, that's, that, that's those sightseers. You got you to be careful if you're a sightseer because you're not a faith liver. Right? Type two is, um, do me a favor, do me a favor. Take one hand and cover up one eye. Are the lights on in this room? You can see it? Right, but can you see darkness? You can see darkness in the light? You see, yeah, that's that one eye covered blind. You know what you see? Division. Division. You see? Sometimes up, sometimes down. Right? Vision is significant to faith. Division is counterproductive to faith. Because what you'll do is you have faith sometimes and sometimes you don't. Right? I call it blended faith living. Faith for some things, but not faith for all things. Right? I got faith for this, but I ain't got faith for that. I got faith that the Lord would raise me up from, from a cold, but cancer? Are you with me? You see, that, that changes the scope of things, right? Now, remember, don't get nervous because watch this. The potency of your faith is not your faith. The potency of your faith is, who, is in who your faith is in. And that's what has happened. We've created a generation of churchgoers and believers who, who watch this, worship faith, but not have faith in God. We've got faith for other things, when the reality is, is that's a misappropriation. I'll talk about this in a minute. That's an abuse of faith. Because faith was never to be for things. Faith was always given to us that we might be in right relationship with God So because it's faith in God. So we got faith for house, we got faith for a car, we got faith for spouses, we got students who got faith for good grace. Just study. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm telling you? We, we faith everything. That's 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 not right. Okay. Now, 
The third type of, 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 of blindness is both eyes closed blind. Do me a favor. Close both of your eyes. I promise you I'm not going to go. This is not a stick up. Close both of your eyes. Now, while you have your eyes closed, I want you to think of your favorite food. You see it? I can tell you that it is seeing ice cream. Right? You see it? You see it, right? No, you don't. You envision it. You envision it. You don't see it. You envision it. Right? Because that's what faith does. You can open your eyes. Right? That's what faith does. Faith allows you to envision what God has promised. Are, are you with me? Jesus cursed that fig tree, walked away. On the way back, paid no attention. Why? He had faith to believe that it was going to be what it was. We only get the story in the Bible because of Peter. The fig tree is only referenced a second time because Peter. Because Peter shows us how what we see oftentimes reveals where our faith is and where our faith in God is. Am I making sense? Let's keep working. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Into the Hebrew. It says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith. Now listen, listen, listen to what he's saying. He's saying that, the, that whatever is righteous of God, whatever is the righteousness of God, the only way it can be seen, now watch this, the term used is revealed. Right? You know what reveal means? It means to uncover. It is not seen. It is so, but it is covered up. And the only way it can be seen is from faith to faith. In other words, with your eyes closed, much of what you view naturally does not require faith. What God is trying to do is show you with your eyes closed what it is he has for you. But because we won't close our eyes, we got to see. Oh, we've got God vision. We see God in some things, we don't see God in other things. We then are, are muted, all right? We, we mute ourselves from experiencing what God gave us faith to see. And we got to work on it. So watch this. So, so the righteousness of God revealed, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The word just, dakaios, is the approved of or the acceptable of God. Hear me when I tell you this. You're not acceptable by God because you met 52 Sundays of the year. You're not acceptable by God because you have a position in the church. You're not acceptable by God because you're giving your hand to the preacher and your heart to the Lord. No, you're acceptable by God when you, when you watch this, when you are the just. What is the just? How's the just determined to be just? By their, not just by faith, by their what? Living by faith. Are y'all understanding what I'm showing you? See, we've got, we've got to get to the point that if, we, if we're really going to practice, right, deliberate faith, we got to understand it requires the fullness of our living. You can't, you can't just believe God for some things and not for all things. Are you with me? Are there any comments or questions to say? No, sir. Let me know. 
All right, come on. So, 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 so what do we want to do? We want to know what it takes. We want to know what it takes, right, to, to become the believer who, who, who deliberately lives by faith, right? So practice deliberate faith. You got it. Y'all ready? Permission to teach. Permission granted. <laughs> Here we go. You got to be clear on what you believe. You've been many times people in church don't know what they believe. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about what you believe religiously. Because religiously, all that's going to tell you is the context of how you practice faith. But, but faith, even that is wrong. Because we're really not practicing faith. We're practicing religion. But, but are y'all with me? Y'all understand that statement? But religion has taken the place of relationship with God. You've got a relationship with God and it has nothing to do with no karma. Yeah, 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 you do. You, you have a relationship with God and it has absolutely nothing to do with what you do at the church. Or let me say this, or you should. Because if the sum total of your relationship with God only has to do with what, how you religiously practice, you're certainly not living by faith. You are compartmentalizing your relationship with God when God wants all of you. Are you understanding where I am? Y'all with me? So you got to get clear on what you believe because to the magnitude of what you believe concerning God will be the magnitude in which you exercise your faith. Many Christians aren't living by what they believe to be true because they don't know what they believe in the first place. So what happens? Watch this. The result of that is this. We don't have faith in God, we have faith, right? And we turn our faith in things. I got faith for the house. I got faith for the car. I got faith for the job. Are you with me? And that's called violating faith. It's an abuse of faith. Okay, let me put it where you can, you can grab. Um, your significant other says that, you know, that, that they, they, they bought this diamond for you or this diamond watch brothers for you, right? And you're like, thank you. Then the next day they take that diamond and they give it to somebody else. You know? <laughs> That's a violation. <laughs> so Swan said, and grounds for murder, I think. <laughs> Now, watch what I'm trying to show you. When we put faith in something that's not God, that is a violation of faith. Y'all are mighty quiet. You can, put all, you can put your faith in that car if you want to. You can put your faith in the government if you want to. Like this morning, I was, I was messing with folk. I was meddling this morning. You can put your faith in your retirement if you want to. Yeah. That's a violation. But that's what happens when we just embellish faith, but we don't embellish faith in God. You got to get clear. Who's the source of your living? I don't want to get preaching, but I feel it, y'all. I do. Who is the source of your living? Who sustains your life? If it's God, why are you putting your faith in the company you work for? I'm going to put me to bed. Um, yeah, let me leave that there. What do you believe concerning God? Because that will determine, right, your conviction, your confidence, and where to put your faith. Am I making, does this make sense? All right, let, let me keep working. So you got to get clear on what you believe. Woo. Next thing you got to do, or another thing you have to do, is get rid of the weight. Get rid of the weight. We bear the responsibility for letting go of what is holding us back from truly living by faith. 
For some people, it's a thing. For some people, it's a person. Am I making sense? We've got to understand that God is at work in us. We must operate in wartime lifestyle against the harmful stuff we carry. I'm trying to tell you that we have things in our lives that we carry, and as a result of carrying them, they tell us that our faith is not as potent in God as it is. We got to get rid of that stuff. We got to, we, 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 we got to discard that stuff. All right? Am I making sense? <laughs> okay. Let's keep working. If you're going to practice deliberate faith, you've got to expand your faith vision. How do you do that on a test? This is a test. How do you expand your faith vision? Okay, I'm going to tell you, get an answer. I want you to think now. Close your eyes. No, don't close your eyes. That's what you do. You close your eyes. Because the, the more you keep your eyes closed, the greater you're going to see. At every circumstance and situation. How many of you all believe, watch this, that the Bible says God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? Right? Y'all believe that? So why do you freak out when you ain't got enough money in the bank? The reason we freak out is because, watch this, we got faith in money. Y'all are mighty quiet. You see, you know the scripture. You shout over, over it on Sunday. But do you live in accordance with it all the days of your life? Because if not, you're not living by faith. If you... I'm going to get out of here. That, that's, that's why I know we, we, we're good. If it's God, we're good. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, there's a preacher. He, he, I think I told you this before. Now I think about it. He was building a building. I'll tell you this. He's building a building and he got a call that they ran out of money. And uh, they said, What you gonna do? They were flipping out, right? So he came home, kept calling me, he called me, and it was all flipping out. He said, Wait. He said, um, I didn't say build this building, God did. And if we're out of money, that's God's problem. <laughs> and if God don't respond, then what I'm going to do is take this thing at the foundation. Like, it's going to become the biggest swimming pool in this town. <laughs> Are y'all understanding? See, that's where you got to start, and that's where you got to stay. Now, the only reason you can't start and stay there is if it didn't start with God in the first place. Because if it didn't start with God in the first place, then God doesn't have the underwriter support it, fulfill it, and under the rest of it. But if the vision comes from God, then God then only requires of us that we apply our faith in God. Watch this. And faith without what? Works is there. And apply the works that's within our ability. Y'all are mighty quiet. Many times we think that living by faith only applies to those parts of our lives we label spiritual. But our faith living must be an all-inclusive living by faith. Am I making sense? All right. Let's keep trucking. To practice deliberate faith, you got to open yourself up to inspection. See, the truth of the matter is, there are, too many, there are too many church folk who already think that they're living by faith. And then the other, the other challenge is not many people are telling church people they have to live by faith. They're telling them to have faith. Are you with me? And, then, and, and they're not even telling them to have faith in God. They just said have faith. Right? And so we're running around shouting and screaming and praising. Uh, at least laughing this evening. I think I told y'all Sunday that we shout to a God we don't talk to. <laughs> y'all pray for your pastor. He ain't about to tight. 
But the reality is, is we cannot afford to fool ourselves into thinking that we are living by faith without inspection. Do you know that what the scriptures teach concerning the church, we know this, that he's coming back for a church without what? Spot or blemish. But do you also know that the scripture says that when he, come, when he comes, he's going to be looking to see where he can find faith in him? So the church without spot or blemish will be the church that it is. We're not talking about the, he's talking about the church. He's not talking about our church. Are you with me? Faith is that significant that, 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 that in the second advent, when the return of Jesus, his eyes will be looking for where faith is. So, 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 um, you got to inspect those things that pertain to faith. You got to inspect your prayer life. I'm not going to be as hard on y'all as I was on the morning class. So I just told the morning class, y'all know y'all to pray. We, we church folks to pray for, I'm going to pray for you. You just forgot him 14 step down after you all passed. How many, how many of you have, this is now, now I'm at it, but how many of you have um, a prayer regimen? And, and, and other than when in trouble. Because that's when most Christians pray when in crisis. Am I making sense? But you you gotta have you ought to have you ought to have a prayer diet, a prayer regimen, right? I'm on, I'm gonna get out of that. I'm done. Now. Inspect your prayer life. Check it out. Because no, nah, he won't let me let it go. So Scripture says, man, I'll always pray. Watch this, and I faint. If you fall out, check your prayer life. No, no, I'm serious. If you if, if, if you if you are if you are losing the fort the for, the, the fortitude to live, you're losing the fortitude because things are happening to you, and now you're worn out and you want to throw in and listen, check your prayer life. Leave that alone. Check your study life. This is a good place for shameless plug for Sunday school, Bible study, church. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Are y'all with me? And check your fasting life. What? What are you talking about fasting? Fasting life. I don't fast unless the doctor tells me to do it before the... <laughs> but Jesus says to his disciples, that some things are only dealt with by what? Prayer and fasting. The, the presenting of your physical nature that your spirit man might be built up to handle what you're facing. And what we learn is in those times, God reveals because it is an exercising of your faith. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? All right. Your fellowship life with believers. Let me tell you something. Some of our faith is so diminished that we can't afford to have certain people as our friends. We are so malnourished in our faith that we cannot afford to have faithless people connected to our lives. And you don't need a whole lot of folk who have that, that division condition either. Because God let you go, man. God may be moving in your life in a way to reveal something that he has promised you, but you're connected to somebody who's pulling you the wrong way. Talk about, I can't see it. That, that, I, that, don't, that, don't, that don't make sense to me. What does it make faith to God? Y'all are mighty Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Bible. Y'all know that, right? This is, this is Bible, right? Because you know, the Bible does say that, that that bad character corrupts moral character. You understand? But we but we grew up together. Well, one of y'all should have grown up. <laughs> okay. Seeking a wise counsel. Right? You can't afford to let everybody inform your existence. 
Because some people will give you their perspective, not God's. They'll, they'll convince you through facts that you lose your faith. Are y'all with me? Y'all understand what I'm doing? So you got to open yourself. You got to do the inspection. You got you to examine yourself to ensure. Because yours is the responsibility of holding the faith. All right, let me finish this because y'all starting to look a little strange. Remember, faith without works is dead, so you got to act on what you believe. You have to act on what you believe. Now, watch this. That is not your belief. You act on what you believe concerning God. Because remember, it is never have faith. It is always have faith in God. No matter the circumstance. Are you understanding? You with me? So you got to step out before you know how it will turn out. Moses and the Israelites are standing at the Red Sea. Right? Moses is told to do what? Lift up the rod, dude. Nowhere in the life and the history of time has the lifting of a rod part of the sea. But if he hadn't have done it, they, listen, Pharaoh would have been back in the head. Are you understand? You have to act first. You don't have to see first. Double blind. Double blind action. All right. Do not excel at giving yourself excuses not to live by faith. Well, you know, um, I would, but you're running facts based on your own mentality. Not having faith in God. Y'all still here. And please don't pray about what you can act on. That's an excuse that we make well, I'm gonna pray about it. You know, you, it's not, you, it doesn't need prayer. It doesn't need prayer. If God says give five dollars and it's in your pocket, stop talking, thinking about what you're gonna not have if you give it. Y'all got real quiet. That's faith in money. Okay. Act on it. Don't give yourself an excuse. Well, I got to get to the M&M's in the morning. I can't do this shit. I don't know. I'm using very simple examples because I told you to get it. And then act out. Right? Act out. You ain't got to see the results. You got to believe the results. You got to believe the results before you can see the results. Sense. Now, don't, don't, get, don't get nervous. We're just talking about practicing deliberate faith. Right? This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like in the Bible. That's why I showed you Jesus first. Everything that I just told you was reflected in the operation of Jesus, but it was not reflected in Peter. Right? So God was not pleased. If you read that passage of scripture, because the original language gives us tenses, right? So if it, we use exclamation points and, uh, and, and question marks and things of that nature to, to give the sentiment or the, the, the tone behind it. When Jesus said, have faith in God, he didn't say, have faith in God. Mm -hmm. It was like your mama turned around when you did something, you know, that she told you not to do. That's how he, it was emphatic because it's essential right, to the right relationship that we have with God. Right? We're done. Any thoughts, reflections, questions, comments, virtually or in the sanctuary? And I got time left. <laughs> What are you thinking? What are your thoughts? 
Says, I got time, I'm gonna use it. His daughter's thinking. No questions? Clear? Concise? Well, let me, so, so, so how much time I got? Tell me how much time I got. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, I got 10 minutes. Okay. So let's see. Let's see what else I can say about faith. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So let me work in that. So the question is, what happens if they believe God to be for a healing at one time and then another time something else happens and they don't believe God for healing another time? So let me tell you what, 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 what the challenge is. That, that reflects a um, belief in faith, but not necessarily a belief that is faith in God. So let me tell you why, why I say that. Faith in God says God is a healer. That's where I put my faith, right? That God will heal, right, has more to do with the circumstances and my sentiments. Am I making, does that make sense? Let me, let me do it another way. The Hebrew boys in the fire furnace, right? They said, no, they said, listen, we will, if God will, but we believe. That God came. See, that's faith in God. Right? When we start trying to manipulate the circumstance, right? That's just faith. That actually, it's not even faith. The, the, the thing that, that mm, thank you, Lord. The thing that most people call faith is wishful thinking. Right? It's wishful thinking, and we 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 classify the faith. No, God can. That's all I. That, that's what I believe. God can. It's hard to stop right there. It's because of the assessment. It's, it's, it's the reliance that we have in God. It's it's not as fervent as we oftentimes say, right? It's polluted. Religion. But if you have a relationship with God, right, it's a dependency on God, and it's a dependency on the character of God being God. Because it may not be of God's will to heal it. And if it's not of God's will to heal it, you get disappointment because really what you had was wishful thinking, not confidence in God. Not, not my insurance is, is what God wants for me. Not necessarily what I may want. Remember, I told you, it's not about your feeling. Faith in God is about God. Does that make sense? I know it's, it, I know it's a challenge. I know it's a challenge because we're just not used to it. We're not used to it. We're not used to being told as believers that it is, it's as simple he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek what? Him. Jesus testifies, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The goal is to the Father. But because we have been so sensationalized by religion, we or, or we have been put in postures where our religion dictates who God is, not God dictates our religion. Hmm. Then what happens is, what we do is, if it doesn't happen the way we think it should, we don't call it God. It's one of the biggest tricks the enemy has played on humanity as it relates to relating to God, and that's why there's so much division with the church. I'm grateful. If this thing is going to come alive in you, just remember that it is what. Go ahead.
Pois é, nem. We've been looking at it from at least 55 years here, right? 54 years here. <laughs> what does it mean? Right, but, but what does it mean? What, what does it mean? What does it mean? See, that, that's. Okay. But look at how contradicting that is to our, our function, right? We say it, but then we use it as a tool of divisiveness. To say that they're not of, the, of God because that's not. Man, listen, that's how God progressed faith. He progressed it through con controversy and conflict. However, the objective in doing so was to magnify the one consistent, his faith. That's why it's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That, that's why it's, it, it is central. It is singular. It is God. All things of God. But we don't, I, I don't, I don't want to get too much into that because I'll go somewhere that I, I don't want to go in this lesson. At least. Right? But, but yeah, faith is central. Faith is central. You, you know who the Lord is, right? You know what baptism is, right? How much teaching did you get on faith? It's the thing the Lord is coming back to see, look for. It's the thing that pleases God. I need to go off the air because I'm here at We have not the message called can the Lord can the Lord God come home right uh, I won't preach to y'all till around five years from now but the but the but the, the sentiment is that much of what we do has nothing to do with God or Jesus right I just showed y'all Jesus went in the temple doesn't matter what left went in and cleaned it out because everything that was happening in the temple had nothing to do with the temple All right, um, I'm, I'm sure that's 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes, that's up, because if I keep talking, I'm gonna be called in the court. Anyway, y'all been helped, y'all understand where we are, what we're doing? All right, let's spread, let's spread. I want to uh, make sure that we continue. You got that list? We continue. I'm gonna hold the names because our virtual attendees were not in our prayer time. Um, for those of you who joined us virtually, I want to, want to encourage you um, to exercise prayer for um, Sister Gina White. We're praying for Sister Gina White, whose husband is having surgery. Her mother is in isolation due to COVID, and her son has had a, another surgery due to a collapsed lung. Let's continue to pray for the comfort and healing of Sister Gina White and her family. Um, Sister Beverly Williams' sister uh, it has been transferred to hospice, so we're going to pray for the comfort and the strengthening of uh, her sister and um, Beverly as well. Sister Jamie Rice lost her dad, passed away on yesterday. So we'll be praying for comfort and strength for the Rice family. And then Sister Vera Hare, who is the aunt of Sister Karen Jackson, uh, is having a procedure tomorrow. We're going to pray for the blessing of the Lord on that procedure and on her body. Also, I talked with um, Sister Brown, and she and her family are just getting to resolve, taking care of the circumstances uh, of the loss of her niece. So we're going to be praying for her as well. And then I also understand that Sister Rosie had a fall. All right, so we're going to be praying for, for Sister Rosie. You tell us she shouldn't have been skating. She should, you know, mm -hmm. you tell us Sister Rosie we're praying for her as well. Anything else? Any other prayers? Any other? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, wow. We're going to pray for uh, Brother Stevens' wife, um, Alan Stevens' wife, his was carjacked. So we want to be praying um, for 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 her peace of mind. And um, yeah, 
Y'all, we, we, we live in, in challenging times. Oh, let me share this. And I, I promise you, let me share this. Um, my wife asked me a question the other day that I just couldn't shake. And um, I want to share with you, hopefully, that it creates for you an urgency um, to be who God has called the church to be. She asked me a question. She said, she said when will we know when we move from the dispensation of grace to the dispensation of judgment. Mm. How will we know? Is what she says. But you don't know what, what is covered under grace, what is forgiven under grace, what is what is what is what is experiences God's favor under grace is not given that under judgment. And so there are many things we don't know. And uh, there have been studies of things. But what it struck in me was an urgency. There's an old song, y'all may know it. It said, get right, church, and let's go. And that's what I want to encourage you to do, to take from this and all of this. Listen, there's still a reality of the Lord's return. There's still all of the things that are associated with sin and going contrary to the will of God. There's still a reality. Despite us worshiping in a comfortable place and having fine memories of life and things of that nature, there's still a reality to this thing that we are to own. And I want you to just take that to heart with you. As we pray, we don't just offer empty words. We need God to touch. We want God to bless our church. We want, we want God to bless every church door that's open in his name so, so the church can literally affect the world and change the world. So let's just pray tonight. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come and we are grateful and thankful for the study on faith. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to develop our faith. We recognize that without it, we can't please you. But Father, that's exactly what we, we, are, we are professing that we want to do and we are intending to exercise, Lord. We want to please you in all of our ways. So thank you for helping us, Lord, gain understanding of that which we know is essential to pleasing you. Father, we, we pray that as the word is going forth, Lord, that it is not falling on deaf ears. Allow us to continue to pray, continue to study, that we might see the manifestation of this word in our living. Father, we pause in intercession. Lord, we're lifting up to you, Sister Gina White. We ask that you bless her husband with a speedy recovery, Father, that you touch his body, that you bring it back into subjective to how you created it. In all things, every organ, every vein, Lord, will function as it is supposed to. Every joint, every every supply, dear God, we thank you for it. Now, we ask that you bless her mom, dear God, with presence, the presence of assurance that she's in the nursing home. Touch her body, Lord, heal her of the COVID disease, and Lord, we we ask that you bless her son. God, we pray that you give him speedy and godly recovery uh, in his organs and in his entire body, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Father, we lift up to you, Sister Beverly Williams. Lord, we ask that you give her comfort as she cares for her sister, Lord, as she deals with the transference of her sister to hospice. Lord, we know the loving and kind touch of hospice, but God, we need your presence in the room. We need you to work in the circumstance, Lord, we ask the Heavenly Father that you show that you indeed are the keeper and the sustainer of life. And the Heavenly Father, you're the, you're the orchestrator of all the things pertaining to the believer. So touch them, comfort them, and strengthen them, Father. Do it in the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we ask that you wrap your arms around the Rice family. Touch Jamie, dear God. We know losing a father is tough, but God, we know that you promised to be our Heavenly Father, so Lord, fill the gaps, fill the voids, and Lord, allow your comfort as you said you want to be with them in times of bereavement. Father, we ask that you touch Sister Vera Hare. Lord, first of all, comfort her niece, Karen. Lord, and then touch Sister Vera's body. Lord, we know you to be a God who heals. And Lord, we yield to your will. We ask that you just touch, Lord, if your grace and mercy allow Sister Bill. We ask that you give wisdom to the physicians, Lord, that they might treat and see all things, dear Lord, that works for the betterment of her existence. 
and we thank you for it in advance. God, we ask that you touch Sister Brown and her entire family. God, we know that they've had a, a bombardment of loss in their lives, Lord, comfort. Lord, we ask that you bring peace in the midst of the family. And God, show your hand mighty. And Lord, allow love to prevail as they engage the circumstance of their bereavement. And Father, we ask that you bless uh, Stephen's day. For we ask that God that you comfort her, Lord, steady any fears and phobias concerning being out amongst people. God, we ask that you bless her husband by her side. And Lord, give them the strength they need to move beyond this challenge of life and to continue to glorify you with their living. And God, I simply ask, God, that you continue to bless this church, each and every person present virtually and physically, or the unspoken concerns, things that are on the hearts and minds of your children. Lord, we ask that you just touch and meet us at the point of our needs. God, we are so thankful for our place in the body of Christ, and we take it not for granted. Help us to live for you as you desire us to live. And God, as we prepare to leave this place, to the memory of your presence, we pray that you be with us, that you lead us and guide us, and make us to meet our destination safely. Lord, until the next point in time, we pray with gratitude, and in Jesus' name, and all God's people would say, amen. 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 Thank you all. God bless you. Good night to those of you who've joined us virtually. Good night, Jack. Back. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank you, Pastor. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Everybody. Good night. God, Good night. God bless. God bless. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.